How are you doing, Otto? Hi, Julian. Uh, I'm doing um, very well. Thank you. So I'm really glad to to have you on the podcast that I was uh, just explaining to you uh, of, of record since your book, you know, Leading from the Emerging Future that I read back in 2015 was really right at the beginning of my own transformation process that led me to do this, you know, which is having a podcast, but also investigating about what's going on with, uh, with the world right now. So again, thanks, thanks for that. And uh, I want us today to talk precisely about that, you know, what's going on with the world and how we, can we make sense of it and what can we do about this. And your work is about understanding how the system as a whole functions, what are the pieces, what are the links, what are the dynamics, and, and then, you know, how can, we, how can we change things. I would like to start right there with the question about system. What is system thinking and why is it so important to you? You know, how did you get into this? Well, systems thinking um, somehow deals with, uh, you know, is a term. Why are we talking about that? Because it's a term that somehow relates to the whole, right? And then the question, of course, is always who is whole and who is defining what the whole is and um, what actually is the whole? Uh, and uh, is there anything like that? But um, I think uh, a, a reason why we talk about systems and ask the questions um, uh, in regard to the whole is because we live in, in situations right now in organizations, we see it in families and communities, we see it on a societal level, certainly also on a planetary level, that things are falling apart. So, so that's we see that on many levels. We can go uh, into depths there. I'm, I'm sure that whoever is joining this uh, podcast as a listener has had similar experiences. We are at the risk of and in the process of things are falling apart, which means um, collapse. And um, then the question um, of the whole comes back in, right? So we, we maybe thought uh, that uh, we were beyond that question, but it comes back in. And the system, so system is um, a term that really attracted me from Europe here to the US. I, I joined the um, MIT Learning Center some 25 years ago. In frankly, in order to explore more the question that you are asking, um, and um, I know you have had some other interviewees from that group um, uh, on your pod podcast earlier, but um, I think uh, systems thinking um, I saw as a tool to make sense of uh, our env environmental crisis, of our social crisis, and also of our inner, our mental health and, and spiritual crisis that we see in many situations and um you know the old saying right if you're not confused and maybe that also goes to the title of your book right that you just uh, uh, showed to me uh if you're not confused you're out of touch right that, that's kind of the old line uh and it deals with that you know uh the world is actually full of contradictions right let's let's not forget that only theories are contradiction free right the moment you deal with reality, you deal with contradictions. And I would say today we see the next iteration from that, right? And I would say um, today, if you are not depressed, you're out of touch. And um, so, in other words, what I mean, and that speaks to our, our current condition where it's actually the one thing that personally is irritating me most is the sense of collective depression, particularly among young people, right? And um, I think it's one of the biggest issues we need to address. But when thinking more about that, I, I realize it's not just a negative because depressed means you're no longer in denial, right? So uh, we have been in denial for a long time in regard to environmental issues and other issues. So if uh, uh, many today are, find themselves in a state of depression, it may be actually a progression from denial. So now we are dealing with reality, and guess what? It's very challenging. But of course, um, uh, when you're depressed, you are still in denial of one thing, not about the reality right? that, that you face. You are no longer in denial of that. But you are in denial. If you are depressed, you are in denial of your own capacity 
to change that system, to shift that system. And that's essentially what systems thinking is about, to address those deeper layers of where not only how the system operates, but um, where we are a part of the making of the world. Hmm. Isn't there a contradiction in uh, inside system thinking? Because if you look at the world, you know, it's something so complicated to be capture in a system you know so and and you mention it it's uh, it's very difficult to grasp the whole reality and every time we we think that we have that we have it that means that we're missing something so what are the limits there that we need to acknowledge first within you know system thinking and within our capacity to to sense it all and to describe it all well the I would say the power of systems thinking um, is uh, grounded in the power of science, right? And science and technology have been amazingly um, successful, right? When you look, so we live in the age of the Anthropocene. And why is that? Because of uh, the age of science and, and technology. It also came with a shadow, right? With a, uh, you know some negative unintended side effects. So I would say um, the limitation so that the credibility and the power of systems thinking is its groundedness in science. Um, its limitation is um, based on the same condition, right? Because systems thinking, uh, the way it's usually applied is looking at the world from outside. And while when you look, um, you know, even in 20th century quantum physics, right? You, you say, well, that's actually not a, a, a lot less clear. You actually cannot separate the observer from the observed, right? There, there is an intimate relationship. So even though that has been working in physics for quite a while, now is in question, right, uh, through quantum physics, uh, at least for certain uh, areas, certainly what we know is that in social science, that's not enough, right? In social science, we participate in the world in a much more intimate way than we do uh, when we observe, for example, other species. And um, uh, so I studied with, um, so my thesis advisor uh, was uh, the peace researcher, Johan Galtung. And he liked to say, so, and what really, when I caught fire as a student, right, was his concept of social science, which is not, let's find the laws kind of that um, tell you kind of what, what's, what are the rules that govern um, behavior of humans or social behavior or societal behavior. No, his question was this, social science is seeking and breaking of invariances. So it's not cementing these rules, but exploring the conditions under which the patterns that we collectively enact can evolve and change. And that's really kind of uh, what um, separates. I think that's kind of the difference, really, between natural sciences and social sciences, that we have a more intimate connection with what we observe. And that's why the, the concept I'm using, instead of... Um, systems, uh, 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 okay. the, the concept of systems is, or this concept of social systems is the concept of social fields. And what is the social field? It's basically a system with a soul, or you could say it's a system that's seen from outside and inside, right? That has an interiority like we have as humans. In, what is interiority? It means it has feelings, it has ways of reflecting and making sense and so on. It might even have like a sense of purpose, right? Or kind of a, like a spiritual core or something like that. But it definitely has this interiority is really the, that sense-making patterns and also kind of the um, relational patterns. And so that's where, for me, that is systems thinking applied to social sciences. But because most of traditional systems thinking is based on a third-person view, right? I look at the world yep. from outside. Um, I'm using the, the concept of social fields as a concept that looks at, social, uh, at systems, not just from outside. Yes, that's necessary too, but also from inside. And that's where the main category 
the main differentiator is to uh, differentiate between different qualities of relationship, between different qualities of listening and so on. And that's kind of where we get more granular into these um, qualitative patterns. I would like to go back also to what you mentioned uh, talking about depression, because you created something called Theory U, which is described as a process of transformation. And like we need to go down and uh, to the depression and then go up and build something new. And, uh, and we find this idea of the U shape, you know, across many theories, many traditions, in also in all sorts of the cycles, you know, like uh, that you can find in many traditions. Uh, you find it also in the Kubler-Ross grief, you know, like U-shaped process. I, I would like to in, you to introduce the theory U and what's with the U and the transformation process and... Uh, yeah, how do you explain the theory and um, how what you said in the introduction in the introduction, you know, illustrates that that process that you're working on and that is so central to your work? Yeah. So um, theory, you uh, essentially is two main things. Um, uh, one is a framework, and the other one is a set of methods and tools. So the framework part uh, is um, basically. Um, making visible um, so the, the, the framework part is, is essentially kind of based on two main uh, uh, propositions. One is that you cannot change a system unless you change consciousness, right? So that, that means you cannot really change a social system unless you transform or evolve the mindsets of the people who are enacting that system. Most people who deal with real change situations are very aware of that, right? So yet in so most of social science is not based on that because we, we look at kind of how people behave and, you know, describe uh, kind of rules that always, uh, that only, that are, uh, always uh, true only under the condition of certain qualities of awareness so so that you that there are certain third variables that cannot change but if you change the quality of awareness of people in a system that Im immediately is changing kind of the patterns kind of how they interact with each other so so that's the first one uh, to change a system you need to change consciousness and the second one is, the way you do that is by making systems see and sense and invert themselves. So making the systems see themselves is the classical uh, systems thinking, right? Basically holding up the mirror. And we know that from our personal lives, right? If you go through a behavioral um, uh, period, a period of behavioral change, um, what do you do? You get yourself a coach, you talk to a friend, kind of you have kind of some some uh, mm -hmm. content, getting insights right? on on your own system that you cannot see yeah? exactly so so we all know that we do that kind of that's how now what do we not have in society exactly these uh, these these structures right so so yes the mirroring is the seeing yourself is the first part but what we found is that in social um life that's not enough because that's just kind of looking into the mirror from a hat to a hat, right? I see what's broken with you. I see what's broken with the system. But, you know, what's the biggest problem we have today in society? It's not that we don't know what the solution is. We know what the solutions are. It's the knowing-doing gap, right? And you cannot bridge the knowing-doing gap by more knowledge, right? What you need to do is you need to... So if the knowing-doing gap is... the disconnect between the head and the hand on the level of the collective, the way to bridge it is to activate the knowing of the heart, right? Kind of the, the, the in other words, what we learned in many uh, practical projects is if you want to unlock collective creativity in any kind of system, the gateway is the feeling that I need to feel the pain on the other side of the divide. Uh, because if I do, then I'm much more willing to, say, give up some of my own privilege. So, so that's kind of number two. It's making the system see and sense itself, right? 
The moment I experience the system through the eyes of the most marginalized, right, I am, you know, immediately new ideas show up, immediately new connections manifest. And that's something we have seen in, in, many, in many cases um, before. And the third one is the inverted self. That's um, essentially about taking, you know, taking an, you know, in, internalizing externalities, right? Really taking in the concerns of other stakeholders in the system and also sharing your own. It's kind of basically the inner and the outer. And if you put these three conditions into place, that's when we have seen you know, awareness shifting and then uh, shifting the pattern of relationships and the quality of results. There's a lot to unpack here, obviously, and I will, um, I will go back to, the, to yeah. the how we change things and how we touch okay. uh, into emotions a little bit later. I would like to stay with um, the analysis part, the diagnostic you make, which I found also very interesting, which is about the what you mentioned about you know knowledge, uh, which is um, knowledge about understanding what's going on with the world right now, and the difference there is between the symptoms that we see in the news or that that we see you know like every day in different events that that are reported to us, and the deep causes of these symptoms that we they almost never discuss, and according to you. You, there are three divides that can define our current age and that are forcing us, as you said, to look into the mirror and see what we are doing to ourselves. And these three divides are the symptoms of something deeper that, that we need to address, that we need to fix. Can you share that, uh, that analysis, that kind of iceberg you know, that, that yeah. you describe? And, uh, and is it really defining our times, defining so special to our era? What is so unique about it right now? Yes. So if you um, look at the world today from a systems lens, what do you see? You see that in most larger systems, the following description applies. We collectively create results that nobody wants. What are examples, right, of results that nobody wants? Um, you mentioned one, environmental destruction, right? It's the ecological divide. Another one is um, the um, social economic divide, right? Um, it's essentially kind of um, obscene levels of inequality, right? Uh, we see polarization. We basically see societies falling apart. You can clearly wit witness it here in the U.S., um, uh, the, you know, a journey into that direction. And then the third one, of course, coming out of the pandemic, right? We all know it. Uh, it's like the, uh, the, the mental health issues. In the U.S., uh, according to a recent CDC study, 60%, percent six zero uh, percent of teenage girls uh, report about consistent, persistent hopelessness and uh, symptoms of depression. So um, there is like um, in the, uh, according to a recent study in the G20 countries, so that is um, 60% of the world population and 80% of the world GDP. So it's essentially kind of all the polluters right on earth. Um, 60, so uh, 74%, so three out of four people in G20 countries today support the transformation of our economic and social system to better address climate change and inequality. So the, the, the awareness is there that there is something broken, but what's not there is how, how we actually do that. And that's now, so systems thinking is, you know, starting on that level that you mentioned, the level of symptoms. So we have these three major issues, the ecological, the social, and the inner, or you could say the spiritual, cultural divide. Uh, and it's... And, and, and what, what, just to, to dwell a little bit on this, why do you... It's, it's a divide uh, because um, I believe that at the end of the day, uh, so... So when we, um, 
at the end of the day, these symptoms that I just described are a, a social manifestation of a disconnect that I have from my environment, that I have with my uh, with other you know fellow humans, right on a on a social level, disconnect with others, disconnect with uh, nature, and um, the the symptoms of depression and mental health issues uh, are. Uh, essentially uh, alienation, right? So it's a disconnect from myself. And um, so to address these issues, so that's why uh, I'm calling them divide. And the other side of the divide is that they are a mirror where we can recognize ourselves, right, uh, uh, into these collective behaviors and wake up and therefore uh, activate a new level of awareness and, and new types of behaviors. What uh, we actually see happening in many places uh, around the planet right now. So I think this um, awakening of everyone knows about the story of destruction that I shared before, the ecological, the social, and the, uh, the mental health issues. But what is much less, and that's one big story of our time, of our moment, but the other story, which I believe is the most important, least well-told story of our time has to do with um, the awakening of a new awareness. It's the 74% that I mentioned. It's kind of that not only most leaders you talk to in institutions, but also uh, on a grassroots level, most people today know that what we are doing today is not sustainable. Uh, they want to be part of a new story um, but they they don't know how. And system thinking is unearthing kind of some of these deeper structures that need to be addressed because no one gets up in the morning and says, look, today I want to destroy more of nature, sure. apply more violence to others and myself, and yet somehow collectively we are doing that. But don't you think that there is still you know, a long way to go before having a certain level of consciousness, especially from the people that are in charge, regarding the, the roots. Because everybody agrees on the fact that there is a problem, that we don't want the results of that. But I don't find the conversations related to, related to why this is happening very interesting so far. And, and, and can you, what's your view on, okay, what are actually the, the roots of these divides? And... Uh, um yeah and then we can go into how do we how do we fix that yeah so i would say um so i would uh, phrase that slightly differently I, I would say where where is it i don't see change um so where i agree with your statement and that's mostly on the levels of collective behaviors right in spite of climate change we have still you know putting all the subsidies into coal, right, and oil and fossil fuel. We are still kind of uh, putting all the subsidies in the, you know, um, extractive uh, uh, industrial agriculture, not in regenerative and so on. Uh, but when you, where I do see the changes is on the level of individual awareness. So have our, and, um, you know, more and more conversations on a community level, uh, on informal leadership levels, you see a very new awareness showing up and it's happening quickly. And it's it's happening um, not in public often, but it's happening kind of in smaller circles where people feel safe enough to, to address their not knowing because most people feel, I, I learned at school, at university, I got the tools how to operate in the old world, which is basically an extractive uh, economy, but I don't have the tools and uh, I, the equipment that I need to be successful in the new era that uh, many feel is beginning now. So what, what I would say is this, um, that when you look at the um, deeper issues, there is a first layer of structural disconnects, right? So we can, and I mentioned some, right? We know kind of... Um, we, are move, we need to move moving out of fossil fuel. We are still putting all the subsidies. So there's a disconnect between what we say and what we do. 
Um, but then you can go and there is like, I would say there's like seven different acupuncture points uh, that I could go into if, if we have the time or if you have more interest in that. But uh, let's just, we just mentioned one. So let's just drill deeper a little bit and say, look, okay, so why is it that we do, um, that we still are stuck in the old patterns of collective behavior? And I think that leads then to our patterns of thought, to mental models. Peter Senge used that term. You know, I would say it's paradigms of thought, right? And, for, and when you look, for example, into um, economic theory, right, you see that all our key categories of economic thought, the classical economic thought, is based on uh, an economy of extraction where we uh, don't value nature and um, uh, an awareness that, you know, is best described as ego system awareness, homo economicus. And yet, um, when we take the challenges of this century uh, seriously, we know that we need to move from an extractive to a regenerative economy, right? Like circular and so on and so forth. And we need to move from uh, a consciousness that's just uh, organized around my own ego, uh, on e around ecosystem awareness, to one that I would describe as ecosystem awareness. What is ecosystem awareness? It's awareness of my own well-being and what serves that but also uh, of the situation from all the other stakeholders in the system so I can factor that in in my own decision-making. And that's actually something. So I, I'm talking as a realist here. So you can go into any industry. That's happening, right? For example, the emissions, scope one, scope two, two, scope three, all of that are basically, we are forced to think, right, in terms of the whole supply chain to internalize the concerns of others into our own decision making and so i think there is it is um, a change that's already a lot more underway than often acknowledged but it's also true that uh, you know there's a lot of choice into that and and certain um, companies certain leaders certain uh, countries are further along this way uh, than others you wrote uh, i'm quoting you um, I think this is on your website. Uh, the power of attention is the real superpower of our age. And um, can you explain that? You know, wh why is it so important to pay attention to our attention? So, I mean, number one, um, those of... Um, the, the listener to that podcast, I mean, probably everyone has um, noticed that um, mindfulness is a topic that went from obscure like 20 years ago to almost mainstream today. I'm not sure about France, but it's yeah, yeah. definitely true here. It's definitely true for... Uh, for it's think, something here too, yeah. Yeah. So why is that? And it's, uh, it's happening in health and education and also in management and leadership. And it's called, cause it's underpinned with science, right? And the science bit says, look, um, if you, um, you know, uh, so when, when you look at the, uh, uh, the brain science, um, neuroplasticity, right, is something uh, so that our brain keeps changing according to be the behavior. Uh, so according to the way we pay attention, that's something that in the past we thought is only applicable for very young people, right? And kids, teenagers, maybe. And then you got what you got. No. Now we know it's, it's actually true for, um, you, know, you know, many, many um, additional decades in a human's life that basically the structure and the connectivity of your brain is a function of your own behavior, is a function of how you pay attention. And that's essentially, in other words, if you meditate 30 minutes a day after two weeks, you can measure the results, right? And that's in the growth of certain areas, certain structures in your brain. So that's kind of the underpinning there. And, um, uh, so what is uh, meditation? 
Meditation is essentially paying attention to our attention, right? It's activating a meta level uh, awareness. And it's uh, also aligning attention and intention. So you, you usually use an object. It can be the feeling of your body. It can be your breathing. It can be a mantra that you're using. It can be an object, actually. You place your attention. So that's um, you align attention and intention. Kind of that's kind of the essence of meditation. But what I when I first heard that from John Kabat Zinn, right, who explained it to me, uh, I thought, well, that's funny because I I always thought uh, paying attention to your attention, right, which is essentially focusing, right. That's what leadership is about. Because what do you do as a leader, you focus your organization, right. You shape fields of attention, right on something that is uh, more important, something that is less important, and so on. And uh, in this century, what's the essence of the 21st century economy? It's attention. We live in an attention economy. Everyone is, you know, essentially competing around that. And that's why I think our capacity as humans to not only work with a reactive mind, so I focus on whatever I want to avoid or something or what's kind of distracting me, uh, but that we have the capacity to align attention and intention, right? To place our uh, attention on a future we want to bring into reality and to effectively reshape the future and reshape the patterns of our own behavior. Remember in COVID, within a couple of months, three, two, three months, we, on a global scale, changed the way we were washing our hands. That's unheard of. There's no other, so there's no other species that can do that. So fundamental practices to change that in such a short time. And of course, um, that was... Um, a challenge in our face, and there have been many experiences with the pandemic that were less successful, granted. But now, of course, the, the challenge is to apply the transformative power of our attention. And when we are on to the right topics, right? Yeah. On, on, on the big challenges uh, that are just ahead. So uh, I would like to go into practical things to, to see you know, how it works. How can we change? all this because i understand that there are many you know deep roots explaining what's happening today some people would say it's the it's related to our um, fears fear of not belonging fear of death fear of uh, you know like being uh, out of the game some other people like richard henbe will talk about power games and the fact that we are we want to be powerful and nations want to be powerful and individuals want to be powerful and therefore we are in that race and we cannot stop it. What's also interesting is that we have a lot of structures that are preventing us from changing, you know, like that could be indicators, that could be technological structures, etc. If we start with, with attention, we have, you know, the attention crisis today, which is in part explained by social media, screens everywhere uh the way you know like traditional media function we have huge corporations making tons of profit by you know basically stealing and selling people's attention and creating anger and polarized opinions because that's good for business and this is destroying you know democracies preventing us from building consensus on important issues etc how do we approach this and can because you say attention is so key but today we have an attention crisis. So, for example, you know, where do you start? Is it at micro levels, working with a small group of individuals, or you know, can can we scale it? How do you apply your 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 framework to this? You're very right. Uh, uh, we live in a in, in a moment of attention crisis, and um, we are experiencing. Um, just in the past um, 10, 15 years, a profound transformation of capitalism, right? And what, what was um, the land grab, right? So um, in, uh, in the beginning of um, the uh, laissez-faire capitalism, now is the data grab, right? The, the, the appropriation of data 
you you mentioned kind of stealing data, right? And then you know applying analytics to that and using, thereby transforming uh, our lived experience, right? Mm, in behaviors uh, yeah. into the capacity to manipulate behavior on the level of the collective very very effectively. So so that's. Um, very much an issue that works well for companies, trillion dollars evaluation, and that is also ruining trust and truth, right? Kind of the, the post truth and, and also it's a destruction really of our social cohesion and, and of you know the foundations of democracy essentially. So that's, um, that's the uh, challenge um, uh, we are facing. And, and I think what it... Um, what it's calling for and what you see beginning now, even in Silicon Valley, because when you travel around the world, yes, in Europe, you have awareness for that, right? You go to China, you go to Silicon Valley, what What are you talking about? So, so, so there was, uh, you know, a, not a lot of traction for a long time, but that's changing now. It's very changing. It's uh, both in China and in Silicon Valley, kind of this discussion has arrived. Okay. And uh, it doesn't mean that the, those people in power have changed, right? But the the conversation has started. And I think it's one of the most important conversations that, that we need. And essentially, so for uh, the EU is actually an interesting leader in that. So you, usually Europe is like behind in everything technology. It's a non-player. It's a non-entity, right? It's a two-horse two race, essentially, between China and the US, many fields. But there's one exception. And the exception is uh, regulation that is actually bringing in the social impact and the citizen perspective, uh, not on a equal footing, right? That's not where we are. I, we we wish we would be there. No, but on a on a more um, uh, you know a step into d the direction of equal footing, and I think that's um, uh, so. Uh, the problem with the EU regulation is basically it's risk and it's only you, you looking at downstream applications. And out of the White House uh, a few months ago came some regulation. It's called kind of the AI uh, Bill of Rights. And it's a really radical. Um, so it's, um, it's, um, it's a suggestion how we might um, deal with and, and collectively regulate AI in the future, not just downstream, but really at the level also of generation generating it. Uh, the, the weakness of that is it's just a thought paper. It, it has like, and you know who yeah. owns the U.S. democracy, right? So it's, yeah. um, it's uh, uh, we, we, I don't think kind of we'll see something very quickly there, but everyone, particularly the tech people themselves, are very concerned. So um, half of okay. the uh... no, no, no. I, I'm I'm saying this is interesting what you say because you say you're basically saying that the level of awareness is shifting and that you start having people that are uh, asking the good questions. Basically, it's people like Tristan Harris or you know like the, yep. that are. But what's the how how can we accelerate? What do you see changing? How can we accelerate that and how your you know, ego to ecosystem methodology yeah. applies there and to accelerate things. So I would say uh, this this certainly has uh, like three levels, kind of the um, uh, your original question also. The first level is what can I do as an individual, right? And I think that starts with um, creating your own awareness practice on an everyday level because we need to support ourselves. The only thing we know about the future is it's tough today, tomorrow will be more crazy in terms of distraction of our attention, right? So that, that's the only thing we know. So that problem is not going to go away overnight. And um, we need to strengthen ourselves. We need to strengthen our capacity to focus, essentially, right? Paying attention to your attention is essentially about focusing. And, and what is focusing? It's, uh, you know, honing in on what's most essential, and tuning out the noise, right? It's kind of that kind of capacity, and it's ever more important, not just for leadership, but for life. Uh, that's number one. It's personal practices that you use. Some people meditate, some people do other awareness, whatever it is, but you need to support yourself. 
The second leverage point on that level, um, you know, the personal level is interpersonal, right? You need, no one can do this alone. You need, I think there's a movement in the world right now around circles, small circles, not big groups, but, you know, maybe it's one person, maybe it's three, four, often it's like groups of five or, or so that come together and, you know, really support each other with deep listening, right? So it's, it's uh, you can use processes. We have uh, developed processes also at the Presenting Institute for that. But, you know, there is uh, whatever you use, but you come together in this kind of s- structure of deep listening and not just socializing with each other, but really helping each other to navigate the edge, right, that we are facing in our life and in our work. And then the... the the, the third one is, of course, that is very alive in many people today is the third leverage point is do what you love and love what you do. It's essentially following um, our life's journey and kind of really as the workplace transforms and as um, uh, more and more um, functions of our economy are being played um, through um, uh, or fulfilled kind of through um, technologies that we more and more focus our work um, and realign that with where our passion is and where uh, our intention lies in terms of the story of the future we want to be part of. So that's that's the on the personal level. On the um, uh, macro level, uh, that's what we just talked about, kind of the Bill of Rights and, and, and essentially kind of we need a new social contract essentially with um, uh, today we have technology and big data that works for very few people. And what the task is to figure out what it takes to make AI and uh, big data work for all. And for all means not only all citizens, but also future generations. And that's not what's happening today. And that will essentially require a new social contract. Um, In between those two layers, I think there is like an organizational dimension. And that has to do with the uh, ego to eco, right? With really um, in any kind of... um, leadership challenge uh, that we face today what we um, what we in organizational challenges that we face um, almost all of them are of a nature uh, that no organization no single organization can solve alone but that require the collaboration of multiple organizations often across multiple sectors just think about um, for example, sustainable mobility, right? You need the cities, you need kind of the national regulators, you need the private sector companies, you need the citizens, you need the um, the urban planning people. So you need to really um, uh, rethink where we live and where we work and why it's so separate and so on and so forth. So there is um, all of these really fundamental areas of transformation that are... Um, not that many, actually, but but that are kind of really at issue in this decade and and, and the few ones to come, um, require multi-stakeholder process. That's the only way. Yes, sustainable development goals and so on and so forth. The only way of accomplishing, of realizing them is to shift the patterns of our relationships from toxic or just merely transactional to co-creative and generative. And the only way of doing that, that's what I have learned as an action researcher the past 25 years, is by providing support structures. Providing support structures that support us, not just as individuals, but also kind of on an organizational level to uh, um, to deal with our differences in a way in ways that are more uh, co-creative and more generative and that help us to uh, manifest emerging future possibilities that many people feel are wanting to happen right now but don't know how to uh, realize as of yet. Well, I would like to to stay a little bit on this. Um, And unfortunately, we don't have the time to go to spend more time on your system analysis of all the, the symptoms. 
Yep. So it was the question in, in two part, which is about as individuals, uh, we have so many things that, that, that we can do by listening better, you know, paying better attention. But, and going to the edges, can you develop a little bit this in terms of practical ways? And also, what are the, the main levers to, to pull for the people who really want to have an impact? All right. So uh, two main things. So the, the main levers. Um, so you um, you can look at that question uh, from a big picture view and then from a personal agency view, right? And the big picture view is, um, and that it's a book that just came out a few months ago, um, uh, fifty years after the limits to growth study, kind of that that was referenced uh, in your um, series earlier. Um, uh, the Club of Rome came out, uh, put together a two-year commission on economic transformation. I was part of that, and um, they basically re-ran the model with under the assumption, how we actually can we now respond? How could the transformation work? Can it? And if so, how? And the result of that study, kind of that brought together a lot of this key systems thinkers and um uh, economists um, like Kate Raworth and so forth uh, as well uh, came out with five transitions. It's essentially just five transitions. And that is um, uh, energy, right? The energy transition, the food and agriculture transition. So regenerative energy, re regenerative agriculture. Uh, then it's um, uh, poverty inequality and gender, women empowerment. So those are the five things. Now, interesting, wherever you are in an organization, I think in our much of our daily decision-making somehow relates to that. But what the issue is, is not just individual decision-making around it, but also the collective decision-making. So that's answer one. But that, you know, and it, what I find interesting, um, if you put some deeper structural changes into place, you can see how the climate challenge is actually quite solvable if we just get our act together in terms of realigning attention and intention, right? On the level of, you know, our collective behavior. So that's, that's interesting. What, what I found interesting in running these models is how doable it actually is, even though our current collective behaviors are not suggesting that. Now, the second um, answer I want to give is um, more informed by the recent conversation because, uh, in a way, that's to say, are oh, there like these five or four, uh, four or five levers and, you know, this and that needs to happen. It's, it's all very abstract and collective. What does that do with me? It, it does this, right? So, yeah, okay, I see that. Great. What can I do, right? I, I'm just kind of this, this small person here. That's what happens to most people. And that's the problem with this analysis. So what's actually interesting in systems thinking is that we, the, that we need to move beyond that. And here's what the real lever is, I believe, today, right? Where's the real lever for changing all of these things? It needs to change from everywhere, right? It's not just agriculture and, and energy. Of course, it is those fields. That's no, not a question. But in order to make these five transitions work, right, we need to start the change from everywhere. That's what I'm saying. And uh, everywhere means I need to look into my environment where, where my agency is. And when, you know, when we look into historic examples, when we look into how change is happening actually in nature, what do we see? How does change happen in nature? And the answer is small. And the seeds, it starts with a seed. The seed has already the entire future in it, right? That's all. Uh, but it's very small that often you don't even see it in the beginning, right? But when it's still, uh, when it's taking roots and so forth. So, and where does it grow? In the midst of the old, right? So, so yes, it has certain clusters. It's, it has certain conditions. So, I think the one thing we miss most, and it has everything to do with the collective depression that we talked about earlier, is that it is a misnomer to believe just because what I can do is very small, it is not of utmost 
uh, significance and importance for the future. Because A, we all need to do our part. We all need to show up. And B, that's how change works, right? It starts very small. Any kind of um, uh, bigger, profound uh, story of systems change that I have seen or studied is actually composed of um, a story that has very modest, very small beginnings. And if a system is moving into a period of disruption, right, uh, uh, it is, uh, we all know kind of from chaos theory that small um, causes, small changes can have a huge impact, right, in a bifurcation point, whether a system is moving one way or another. So that's really, on an individual level, it means uh, uh, to... uh, combat i almost said so now you see my american mindset um, you know showing up right my uh, so uh, i would say uh, to address right maybe from from a european perspective to address <laughs> the um uh the issue of collective depression by realizing that all significant changes start small and that it is um Whatever we give our attention, that's what keeps growing, right? We develop in the direction of the questions we ask. So whatever it is you pay attention to, that's kind of where kind of growth will uh, be happening. And that's why being more intentional with our intentions and, 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 and placing our attentions to the seeds of the future that are already existing in our environment right now or in our that we can kind of uh, connect with um, also in our own um, experience that's of utmost importance and that's why these other two levels kind of not just the macro macro but the personal interpersonal and also the organizational level are so important that um, that I talked about before but I guess also what's um, what I find you, you know important is to forget about the bigger issues somehow because it, it you can you can get stuck there. It's uh, if you because you don't even theoretically when you know that when you say okay it's always how history happens you know small changes that you don't see coming. When you are in it at your level, it's uh, it's really difficult to integrate it emotionally. Because you, as you said, you're facing despair. You don't see how you are having a little, your little impact that you're having will make a difference. So I guess that's uh, that's some, something also you're working on. You know, at an individual level, you take you pay attention to yourself. You pay attention to your small community, to the things around you, and then you have a little bit more lever on things. And uh, and you don't start with climate, kind of, is it? insightful what i just said to you when you talk to your students or or do we need actually to have these bigger goals i think we need a little bit of both but um what we what we also need is um uh a conversation about the future that we want to create right and um i would say um as a as as having been part for many years of the uh, environmental movement and in different places one of the things we have been weakest on right is to move beyond threatening people right have like okay this is the end of the world here's what how it's going to happen so uh, basically activating fear and anxiety right only takes you thus far Sometimes it does a little bit of the trick, but it's not sustainable, particularly, I mean, I'm noticing that myself. I used to be that person that, you know, you know, talks about these long-term consequences and so on. Because uh, when you enter the room, you often wear in front of people more of denial, right? What is it that you face today? Well, people are, particularly when, when I talk to younger people, people are already depressed. They're already aware. They already know it's, it's broken. And if I give the old speech, right, so what, what value do I add, right? Because uh, you're in the wrong, the wrong place at the U. Right? Exactly, exactly. So, so what, what's, um, what has my interest these days is really moving beyond this old type of activism that I just described. And 
Um, and you see that in the environmental movement, there is a shift of focus from the old key term, of course, that we all know is sustainability, right? And that's kind of, how is that defined? What's the limitation of that term? It's less bad, right? So sustainable agriculture is, oh, yeah, don't use poison, like don't use uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. No, that's a step forward. That's great. But is it good enough? I don't think so, because the real future agriculture that we, meet, that we need is regenerative agriculture, right? Where food is a medium for healing planet and people. So, so that's really, and you can do the same reframe in, in, health, in, in learning, right? Where we move from student-centric good schools of learning towards um, really whole person, whole systems learning. The same you have in health, where we need to move from um, just, you know, uh, you know, a patient journey and effective health care delivery systems to uh, what's called salutogenesis. So which is kind of a strengthening, not addressing the symptoms of sickness, but strengthening the sources of health and well-being and so on and so forth. I could go through all the sectors, but the key is that all these transitions are sparked by very personal uh, decisions, right? And almost every one of us is, you know, every one of us is actually participating in the, in the um, learning systems and the uh, food. We all kind of consume food. What are the choices we make there? Uh, then you can talk about um, uh, health and um, uh, the, the, the business and the finance and, and the other uh, the other verticals as well. So uh, I would say what we see in the shift of focus from sustainability to regeneration and uh, ecosystem awareness, uh, we see a shift that only is going to happen if it's uh, 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 coming from many different angles. And it's starting very small, and it's 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 a much wider movement already uh, than it's often acknowledged. So it's, in my view, kind of the most important, least well told story of our time. And um, I believe that um, uh, that the future, right? That you know, many people project out there, 2030, 2050, and so on that the future is already here, right? The solutions is already here. It's just kind of that they are not fully manifested yet. Often they're in seed format and they're here means in certain places in our community, certain places in our society, but also in certain places in my own experience. And that's what we need to pay attention to. And that's kind of where we need to build new relationship and also uh, practices, social practices around that. And that's what's happening in many places right now. And, and that would be my, my like questions very much related to this. For the people who are listening to us, do you have a practical piece of advice related to, you know, rebuilding better connections with themselves and with people around them and with, um, with the world? Like where, where can you, yeah, where do you start to be effective for people listening? Well, where do you start? I think uh, in my experience, kind of the, the best starting point is your own personal practices that you find. Yes, many of us are busy, but, you know, find 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes a day. Many people do it in the morning, but it could be also midday or, or evening where you build something I would call awareness practice, something that allows you to focus on what's most essential for you and zoom out, basically filter out um, the noise, right? That's distracting you from that. And so it's a moment of intentional stillness, right? You, it can be a mindfulness practice, can be some other practice. So many people are already doing something. That's where I would say is the first starting point because in order to speed up, we first need to slow down. And the second one is you can't do it alone. You, you, need, you need to find your two, three, four, five partners Look around. These people already exist in your environment. If not, there are many communities. Go to the, for example, the presencing uschool.u-school.org website. There are many um, 
resources where you can team up with other people from your own region and from your own city of the world and so on. And the third one, I think everyone has agency on and where we see a lot of change the last three, four, four, uh, four years is your own journey with your work, right? So how you really um, realign and strengthen the connection between your own work, which is kind of uh, my small W work, kind of so my, my current role or kind of assignment, whatever it is, a project, and your capital W work, which is kind of your sense of purpose, your, your journey, kind of what, what, what your sense is that you're here for. And obviously, those are not things other, uh, other people can tell you what it is, but you can also not just discover that alone. You need kind of this deeper conversation uh, around that, why, which is why the second. I would say those are the three uh, personal and interpersonal leverage points. And then the only other thing is, I would say, um, find there's so many initiatives, I'm sure also in your city and in your region of the world, where um, people... Um, begin to act or begin wanting to act maybe that's the better kind of where this new awareness that something is um uh broken with our current way of operating and we need to to, to move towards more regenerative ways of leadership of kind of running our systems and bringing in kind of a, a more ecosystem awareness point of view into shaping the community or also our economic relationships that's true. I see that with many entrepreneurs, kind of where they, I see that it's not informing collective behavior yet, but it sits in many individuals. And I'm sure when you look, when you really create con new conversational spaces where this awareness can be articulated and collectively inquired into what are we going to do about it, um, that um, will have a big resonance also in your community. Even though at the beginning you may think, well, I'm the only odd person here and everyone else is still. But, you know, that's, that was my experience. Then you talk to people, yeah. you offer a space of listening, and then everyone says that, well, I'm the only one, but I, I can't say it because everyone else is just normal. No, it's, it's, a, it's a planetary movement that is just at the very beginning, and it happens in many more places than people usually think. You know what? What helped me uh, a lot when I did your your course, your training, uh, eight years ago now, was realizing how listening is important. This is the beginning of the process in your in one of your models, and uh, I found it really powerful to realize that we are bad listeners. <laughs> That we, we just you know download information most of the time, and and to me that was a great starting point. I just wanted to share that you know the yeah. the fact to be able to listen differently, listen without talking. It, it it's very true, um, uh, Julian, and um, so it that has been one of the biggest surprises to me, right? Because I never thought so when when I first developed these layers and uh, had observations around that that this would resonate so much. I also. Uh, would have thought in the beginning, okay, so if you're like a grown person, like uh, you or I, I mean, listening, that's very habitual, right? Whatever we do, that's what we keep doing. It's very hard to change that. It's not true. I mean, to my, to my surprise, these patterns, if you apply a more intentional support structure for yourself, for example, ULAP, right? If, if you go, uh, is one that's freely available and that also has a good um, French-speaking uh, community there. You can yeah, do that within six weeks. So yeah, that's the one get, I did actually. Yeah. And and that's that's that's. Um, I would have never thought that these deep behavioral changes are possible in six weeks. I I have the same experience when I teach at MIT, and so that's uh, uh, that's actually very encouraging. So shifting the the inner place from that we operate from more habitual awareness to open-mindedness open -mindedness, uh, to, to compassion, right? More open-heartedness and open will, which is really kind of letting go and letting come, right? Which is the capacity to let go and allow something new to emerge. That's 
a lot, um, a lot. So it can happen in much more, um, in a much more organic way than I would have thought. And why is that? Because many of us already face crisis situations on a collective level that make a pretty, uh, that make a pr pretty convincing case that we needed to let go of something and we need to let come, uh, let come of something else. And so I, I found that 15, 20 years ago, much harder to argue. Now it's like mm -hmm. common sense. And the only mm -hmm. question That's is, nice. all right, how do we do it? Where's the space where we can practice that? Mm. Well, thanks so much for your for your time, Otto. It was a very insightful conversation. I hope the people will like it. And uh, I will put on the website all the resources and uh, all the books and everything. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Julian. All the best. Voilà, cet épisode est terminé. J'espère qu'il vous a plu. Si c'est le cas et que vous souhaitez me soutenir pour m'aider à continuer, vous avez trois moyens de le faire. Le premier, c'est de laisser une note ou un avis sur la plateforme de podcast où vous m'écoutez. Le deuxième, c'est de partager le podcast autour de vous via vos réseaux sociaux ou simplement en en parlant. Et enfin, le troisième moyen, c'est de me faire un don sur Patreon ou Tipeee. Les liens sont sur le site ou dans la description de l'épisode. Je vous invite aussi à rejoindre la communauté grandissante des auditeurs sur le serveur Discord. Nous sommes déjà plus de 1000 à discuter au quotidien de tous ces sujets essentiels. A très vite, merci. <rire> changer le monde <rire> Quelle drôle idée Il est très bien comme ça, le monde pourrait changer <rire> <rire>